behalf of the MCC. Thank you. It's very, very nice of you to sacrifice so much of sleep for this one thing. We must find a time, I think. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining. Shall we begin? Yes, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 10th edition of the TG Narayanan Endowment Lecture Series. We are exceedingly joyful that God has given this great opportunity to all of us uh, to come together virtually to participate in today's lecture. The TG Narayanan Endowment is a result of the benevolence of Dr. Ranga Narayanan, Distinguished Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Florida, United States. Because of this endowment, uh, every year we have the privilege of listening to great minds delivering lectures. To name a few, we have had the opportunity to listen from Dr. G. N. Devi, Dr. C. T. Indra, Dr. Pramila Paul, Mr. Jerry Pinto, Dr. Chitra Banerjee, and many, many others. The TG Narayanan Endowment helps us to organize annual lecture series and essay competitions. We are grateful to Dr. Ranga Narayanan for always being with us as a huge pillar of support. We are also honored to have the illustrious speaker of the day, Dr. Lakshmi Kannan with us. She's a poet, novelist, short story writer, and translator. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us. We are very happy to have our respected principal and secretary of MCC, Dr. Paul Wilson, amidst us. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Go into today's program. The Madras Christian College always honors God. We begin all our programs with prayer. To invoke the presence of God Almighty, I request Dr. Franklin Daniel, a senior professor of the department, to lead us in college prayer. Shall we pray? O thou, who in days past Let's put it into the hearts of good men to found this college for the imparting of sound learning, the building of character, and the spread of spiritual truth and knowledge of thyself. Bless our college and schools. May love, unity, and brotherhood be learned here. May industry, uprightness, and courage grow here. And from this place, May they be sent forth continually, a stream of men and women who shall serve thee faithfully in thy word. We thank you for the 10th TG Narayanan Endowment Lecture that will shortly be delivered by the eminent personality, Dr. Lakshmi Kanan. We pray for the logistics involved, the technicality, that your grace will be there. Even now, we remember the warlike situation and the loss of innocent lives in Ukraine. Lord God, we pray that your mercy will be there, even as your word says in Matthew chapter 24, that there will be pestilences, wars, rumors of war, and famine before your soon return. We pray that the Prince of Peace may rule over our lives. We pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I request Dr. Major Rajan, Head, Department of English, Madras Christian College, to welcome the guest. Thank you, Rachel. 
Good morning. A very warm welcome to the 10th PG Narayana lecture. I'm very happy to welcome the principal, Dr. Paul Wilson, who surprises us with incredible innovative ventures. I'm glad to welcome our Bursa, Mr. Cyrus, for enriching our programs with his kind help. We have a brilliant, charming, and amazing intellectual to deliver the lecture today a unique star among the galaxy of writers who is none other than Dr. Lakshmi Kannan. The ecstasis I had with her reflected her sincerity, radiated her involvement, and revealed her genuineness. We are very lucky and blessed to have you, Madam, and I wholeheartedly welcome you. We wouldn't be sharing this platform with all of you without the thoughtfulness and contributions of Dr. Ranganarayanan father of Mr. T.G. Narayanan, in whose name he has instituted this endowment. We are grateful to you, sir, and I welcome you sincerely to this annual event. I'm pleased to welcome the eminent speakers of the previous lectures, Dr. C.T. Indra and Dr. Pramila Paul. It is a privilege having you with us today. I gladly welcome my teachers, former and present heads, professors and students of our college and the neighboring colleges. I'm delighted to welcome all the friends of the speaker and alumni and well-wishers who have been anxiously waiting for this glorious day. I once again welcome all of you to this session, which I'm sure will be arresting, amazing and absorbing. I wish all of you a blessed and memorable day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ma'am. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have our principal, Dr. Paul Wilson with us. Our principal, Dr. Wilson, has always been a strong pillar of support for the Department of English. We are very honored to have sir with us today. I request our principal to kindly address the audience. address the audience. Principal, sir. I request our principal to kindly address the audience. Is my voice audible? Very audible. Yes, sir. Now, now, yes, sir. So, can you hear my voice, sir? Yes, Arun, you are audible, Arun. Hello, Hello sir. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Audible, sir. Hello. Uh, Arun? Hello? Hello? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. Okay, yeah. uh, I, I couldn't listen to you. Sorry. Because uh, there is some problem here in my mind. Shall I proceed, Arun? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, very happy to be a part of the stage in Naran and Nello Matlech today. And I thank Dr. Lakshmi Khan for having accepted our invitation to be with us to this, this morning. And uh, I just was going through this uh, title called Learning Curve. And it was so interesting to see that um, how our college also is going to be Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Hello. Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're audible, sir. In between, there, is, there was some, some sort of interruption. Um, thank you, Dr. Lakshmi Kanan, for having chosen a topic on learning curve. And uh, as it stands, it is a graphical uh, representation of the kinetics of pleasurable learning. 
um, we call that as kinetics in, in our own language because there is a learning curve to be augmented uh, by different means of know. facilitating the English language teaching. So as I understand that the college is also making efforts um, in making a pleasurable learning when it comes to the language learning. So there are three modes of learning as we all understand. It may be a cognitive means of learning oh, yeah. or it can be affective ways of learning or it can be a psychomotor uh, ways of learning. Having understood this now, we have now uh, exchanged teaching with the word called learning now. I think uh, no more in the literature now we are using uh, the word called teaching now. And I also love the word learning rather than uh, teaching because it, it's almost like the dispensation where we are looking forward for learner-centered approaches and kind of a pleasurable learning. And many times we try to you know, have grievances on students that they are not coming to the classes, but uh, I would say as teacher, we have uh, failed to some extent in drawing students towards the class. Um, if we move from a conventional ways of uh, you know, uh, administering the teaching and learning processes, I think I'm sure the students would definitely be drawn towards the classroom uh, lectures. And uh, in this regard, I just want to mention here that college is making efforts to revive the old traditions, nothing new. We had a theater as a, a legacy that college has now. We are trying to now formalize that particular legacy in the form of conservatory for performing arts. And also um, the cognitive means of learning, writing, thinking, and reading. And maybe Writer's Cafe would be a part of uh, this particular exercise where we would like to encourage students who would like to have a learning style of cognitive learning definitely would get attracted towards the Writer's Cafe. And students who are interested in learning through our psychomotor skills, maybe uh, through an effective learning, probably be interested in um, learning English language by means of theater and the other aspects, other art forms. So I'm sure that with these efforts in college, uh, we'll be able to bring a reformation in English language teaching. And languages I have seen that mostly, I uh, know students, uh, many, 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 many students I've seen that they, they, they love learning through effective means. This is what is my experience, and not only in English, but other languages also. Uh, cognitive means sometimes you're able to read, you're able to write, but you're not able to speak. So uh, the augmentation of learning curve depends on the way we try to change ourselves, or transform our educational system in uh, MCC. If I understood the title this way, I'm sure um, this uh, effort by Nadas Christian College would add value to our educational system in Madras Christian College. And I thank Dr. Lakshmi Kanan for having accepted our invitation and to be with us. Madam, I would love to interact with you on Writer's Cafe. Maybe we can have a separate meeting where we would, I would like to discuss with you on different aspects of Writer's Cafe and we can refine it, we can give structure to it and we can make the learning pleasure. But thank you for having invited me. Thank you very much, sir. Now I invite Dr. Ranga Narayanan Distinguished Professor, Department of Chemical Engineering, University of Florida, to introduce his father, Mr. T.G. Narayan, to the gathering. Can you all hear me? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. okay. Oh, uh, thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank the members of the organizing committee at the Madras Christian College and all members of the audience for giving me this opportunity to say a few words about the late Mr. T.G. Narayanan and why we have chosen to make this endowment that bears his name. Mr. T.G. Narayanan was born on June the 9th, 1911 in the temple town of Kumbakonam. Uh, his, uh, his parents were of modest means. His early schooling was at the Hindu high school in Madras, followed by higher education at the Madras Christian College then in Georgetown. And then later he went to the Madras Presidency College where he completed an honors in English. After a few years of being a school teacher of English in Alway, Narayanan served at All India Radio and then joined the Hindu. He was best known for his years as a war correspondent during which he covered the Imphal Front and the war in Southeast Asia. He also worked substantially on the famine that overtook Bengal. It was a devastating famine that took well over 2 million lives. He saw deprivation firsthand, reported on it, and then wrote a book called The Famine Over Bengal, which, which, uh, which had a foreword by, by Hejalakshmi Pandit. This book described the, the cause of the horrors of the famine. 
still a topic even today. Toward the end of the war, T.G. Narayan was stationed in Delhi. Uh, and there he spent several months interviewing many of the nation's freedom fighters. After the war, Narayan joined the United Nations as the chief of the Asiatic Division. He was associated with the War Commission on Germany, the freedom of Indonesia from the Dutch, and, his, and in his final years, he was the personal representative of the, of the Secretary General, Dag Hammarskjöld, on nuclear disarmament. Because T.J. Narayanan spent many years as a journalist, and because of his abiding interest in social thought and in literature, it is fitting that we remember him by instituting these lectures at his alma mater. The Madras Christian College is noted for its training and education of some of the finest minds and leaders of this country. And my father would have been proud to have his name associated with these series. This will be the 10th lecture of a series that has been endowed. The Department of English has done as always a splendid job in arranging to get outstanding speakers. They started in 2012 with the first lecture by Dr. Gauri Vishwanathan. And then there were several other speakers that included G.N. Devi, that included uh, 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 Dr. Pramila Paul. And then last year, uh, we had uh, Dr. Chitra, um, uh, Ch Ch Chitra Devakarni Banerjee. This year, we are honored to have Dr. Lakshmi Kannan as the guest speaker. And I would like to extend a thank you to her for accepting this invitation. We look forward to your talk. And thank you once again to all of you for arranging this uh, this uh, lecture in this series. Thank you again. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for kindly sharing about your beloved father and for your great benevolence. Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to learn about our resource person. Her achievements have been tremendous and truly inspiring. I welcome my colleague, Professor Merin, to introduce Mr. Ms. Lakshmi Khan. Thank you, Arun. I feel deeply privileged to be able to introduce such an esteemed writer. All of us know Dr. Lakshmi Kannan. She needs no introduction, but I'll attempt to do, to do so. Lakshmi Kannan is a bilingual writer. She uses the pen name Kaveri for her writings in Tamil. Her 27 books in English and Tamil till date include poems, novels, short stories, and translations. Her recent publications in English include The Wooden Cow, 2021, her translation of the iconic Tamil writer T. Janaki Raman's novel, Marapasu, for his sanitary celebrations. Sipping the Jasmine Moon, The Glass Beat, 2020, Genesis, Select Stories, 2041, uh, 2014, and Nandavan and Other Stories, 2011. In Tamil, her titles are Muttukal Patta, 10 Best Stories, 2015, Atuku Poganam, 2011, and Kaveri Kadaigar, 2007. Her works were widely reviewed in Confluence, South Asian Perspectives, London, Vasafiri, International Contemporary Writing, London, Hindu, Indian Express, Deccan Herald, The Book Review, and in other prestigious literary journals. Her works are mentioned in the Journal of Commonwealth Literature, the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Postcolonial Writing, and Cambridge, Who's Who in Writing. Dr. Lakshmi was a resident writer from India for the International Writing Program, Iowa, USA. Charles Wallace Writer with the University of Canterbury at Kent, UK. Participant in the International Feminist Books Fairs in Montreal and Toronto, Canada and in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, British Council Visitor to the University of Cambridge, UK. Fellow of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, and Sahitya Academy Writer attached to the English Department of Jamia Millia Islamia University, Delhi. Dr. Lakshmi has also presented in national and international seminars on gender-related issues, on translation, and on the politics of language. She has published them along with her many reviews of books and reputed newspapers and journals, such as the Sunday issue of the Literary, Literary Review, the Hindu, the Book Review, Economic and Political Weekly, News India and Confluence. Some of her essays are included in anthologies such as Growing Up as a Woman Writer, Translation and Multilingualism, 
post-colonial context, redefining feminism, Indian English and vernacular literature, the creative process, seven essays. She has taught for several years in the Faculty of English in the colleges in Delhi and Calcutta, and in the department of HAWS IIT, Delhi, before she joined as an MNC, joined at MNC as a senior writer. She is currently the vice president of the Poetry Society India. After this long introduction, I humbly request Dr. Lakshmi Kannan to address us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was overwhelmingly generous as an introduction. Good morning, everybody. Anayivarukkum. Vanakkam. Namaskaram. It is, gives me immense pleasure to be here, even if virtually, to participate in the 10th T.G. Darainan Endowment Lecture for Madras Christian College. It's a great honor too, for which I thank Dr. Mekla Raji, Head, Department of English, and Dr. P. Wilson, the Principal and Secretary for inviting. An added delight today is this unexpected bonus of having Dr. Ranga Narayanan joining us from Florida and giving up all his hours of sleep. It must be 11 o'clock at Florida, but it's so very kind of you to be here. And it gives me a special kind of a pleasure to hear you talk about your father and all that he did. He led an amazing life indeed. What struck me when I read about Mr. T.G. Narayanan, star alumnus of your college is, his passionate zeal to put journalism to the best use in whichever capacity, as a war correspondent, as a interviewer of freedom fighters, as coverage of Bengal famine, after which he ended up writing a book, till he ended up at the United Nations Asiatic Division and as the personal representative of no less than the general, uh, you know, the UN General Secretary, Secretary General, sorry, Dag Hammarskjöld as his personal representative. So I thank you, Dr. Ranganarayan, for sharing this interesting paper called uh, Gandhi's Newspaper. And the takeaway point for me from this paper was, he was a connected critic. He could be intellectually engaged with the sharpest political thinker, and yet he could be intimately connected with the local culture. And that is a kind of a balance that I think everybody should strive for. Let's remember him today for having the insight to think that literature is not separable from social thought or political thought. They are one and the same in the best of literary works. I was delighted to know from Dr. Mekala Raji about Writers Cafe, an independent press of your college that publishes creative writings by students and faculty alike from across the same countries and related items such as book reviews, meet the author and uh, all those uh, contributions that you make. I shall take it up at length a little later, the importance of cultivating writing skills and making a better job of what you're already doing it. And I'm sure you're all going to be better and better with each successive writer. The main gist of my uh, talk today is, writing in itself takes you on a steep learning curve, which is equally a journey of discovery. When an author explores the theme he or she has chosen, the theme unfolds itself only during the actual process of writing. And that puts an author on this learning curve in which she awakens to the knowledge that is gleaned for a book. So each book transforms an author in some ways and makes a come out of it a little different, having learned to fathom new findings from creating this book. Then the creative process is a good medium to explore dualism in contrasted realms of inquiry. It helps an author work out the dialectic, which invariably comes with thinking. You see, like, <clears throat> I was asked to read about 
my books, give you a, a kind of a profile about my books, which I will do very, very briefly, because any of you who want extra details can log into my website uh, through the link and you'll get the sensitivities. So I will very, very quickly take you through the three last publications, beginning with the novel, uh, The Glass Weed Curtain. Can I request the technical team to show the, display the title, please? The Glass Weed Curtain. Thank you so much, Miss Baby. Thank you, thank you. Now this uh, novel, is about the last phase of the British rule in Madras presidency. And uh, I think we can now remove the cover. We can now remove the cover. So thank you so much once again. Last phase of uh, the British rule in Madras presidency. And what it gave me a glimpse of this period is a lot of dichotomies in this period of transition and uh, ambivalence contrary beliefs and a kind of uh, sections of uh, reactionary forces who were against the reformers, the social reformers. So my novel features actual historical characters such as uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Ishwar Chandra, Vidya Sagar, Harbila Sharda, and closer to whom Dr. Muthu Lakshmi Reddy and Sister Subha Lakshmi, Margaret Cousins, and all these people. So it was clear, you see, a kind of a time when uh, there were these uh, court verdicts, some court verdicts were so controversial that they shook the conscience of the nation. But it was also a time that was unique for the pivotal role played by the magazines. There were magazines, uh, even in English, Three Dharma, and the one started by Mahatma Gandhi, Harijan and Young India, and uh, Several others, several others that, that were, you know, I got more information from uh, Dr. Ranganarayan's paper about Amrita Bazar Patrika, Indian social reform and all. Why am I mentioning this? You see, while these are in English, in Tamil, there was Kalki by Kalki Krishnamurti, the famous writer. And in Kannada, there was Thai Nadu, which reached beyond, uh, you know, smaller, smaller towns beyond Bangalore and Mysore. And there were several others in Bengali, Marathi and all that. The unique feature is people were avidly reading and getting influenced by the content of these magazines, which very often featured political thinkers, our own leaders in translations. It was a time when they were absorbing subversive writers, anti-establishment writers, and writings that questioned the, you know, the popular schools of thought and brought about a change because it called for a change. So this indeed was one of the features, what I learned a lot while writing this glass bead curtain, which is a metaphor for a kind of a uh, beautiful handmade, you know, thing done by my grandmother's generation. The metaphor is behind the beautiful curtain, there's a lot of injustice. There's a lot of gender bias. There's a lot of uh, confusion. And this was the head. My next book, Sipping the Jasmine Moon. Can we see the cover, please? Thank you. Thank you. That's Sipping the Jasmine It's a collection of poetry, uh, my favorite, Sean. And uh, I think now you can remove the cover if you like. So this genre helped me in a different way because poetry is a very private realm. It's a shy space, almost like a prayer, but it helped me hold a dialogue with figures from archival figures from history, such as Karekal Ammayar, Rashi Shundari Devi from Bengal, and Gautami, the foster mother of Buddha all within that delicate frame of poetry. You have studied my uh, poem from a uh, title called She. I, I was told that, that many of you have studied it in your syllabus. In Sipping the Jasmine Moon, there are many other she's 
which I have left deliberately as a generic term without a name. And it, they are all within the context, cultural context of each one with a distinct cultural context. So there are many other sheets. Those who are interested can kindly buy it from Amazon. The next and the last book is Wooden Cup, my translation. Can we see the screen? Thank you so much. Thank you. This can be removed now. A wooden cow, you see, is a translation of, uh, as uh, my, the one who introduced me to that link, it's a translation of T. Janaki Ram's Marak Pashu. And uh, it is about a musical genius. And uh, I will very, very briefly uh, share with you just one or two points of the challenge that I had. The target language is English. The source language is standard. These two languages, according to linguists, are not isomorphic in, in the sense that they are not similar languages. So you run into challenges and you have to be very innovative when you uh, translate. I'll share one example with you, which I can, because for me, it's a luxury to uh, get a chance to talk in Tamil Nadu because I am an expatriate writer based in Delhi. Nobody understands Tamil. So I can share uh, one example in Tamil. Gopali in this novel is a musical genius, not just that. He has an attractive stage presence. He has such a charismatic presence that one uh, female disciple, Amani, she says, he's so oblivious of it. He's so unselfconscious about it. So she ex she describes him like, his body exuded a childlike innocence. Another feature of Gopali the singer is like uh, if when he sings, it surges on like an ocean. See, like you go to Marina Beach toward the end of an evening, you'll find that the you get a feeling that the ocean is performing for you. Waves after waves after waves. That is how Gopali's uh, music is described. Adu Samadra Mahapum. In both these, you will notice the word Adu, neuter, neutrogen, not other. So this is something that I could not and will not translate as it in neuter gender because it is used in Tamil as a very intimate, affectionate gesture to somebody who you're very close to. So, so that is how we uh, transcend all these things to, you know, find a way out in the process of writing, in the process of translating. Let me share with you very briefly again, um, what happened, like, uh, is the screen okay? What happened, uh, like I was saying, you are in a learning curve when, you, when you're in the prose writing. I'd like to take you back to my days as a school girl, maybe middle or high school girl. Like, uh, and uh, this is vis-a-vis -vis gender sensitivity, where I now I presented papers in uh, India and abroad. But at that time, the editors of my school magazine will always ask me to contribute stories or essays to a magazine. And I would write only when they asked me to. Otherwise, I was not interested in writing. I was more interested in athletics and sports and in reading other engrossing books. But I would never write. But I would write obediently whenever they asked me. So many of my, this thing, invariably they got published with the editorial interventions. One day, the editor teachers sat for a talk with me. And then they said, uh, this is something that uh, amuses me now, today. They said, there is a lot of anger in my writing. And uh, there is so much anger in your writing. Anger against gender bias, 
injustice to the girl child at home and in social circles against families that normalize them? How come you're otherwise a happy girl playing sports, laughing, singing, having a good time with your batchmates? They asked Azit. That's the day I realized how writing gave you a kind of a space to share your innermost thoughts, which you don't even share with your family or friends. Not necessary, but it gets into the writing. So let me take you to um, some of the creative writing workshops that I conducted to show how students react to writing. Just give me a moment for creative writing. I held four creative, major creative writing workshops at different places. And Dr. Premi Lapal Paul is here. One was in her college, the American College, Madurai. The other one was in Karunya University, Coimbatore. The third one was in IIS University, Jaipur. And the last one was in CU Raj, Central University of Rajasthan at Kishingarh near Ajmer. Each one had a different agenda. Uh, and a different kind of programs. To begin with the American College Madurai, both the PG and the UG students, along with, if I'm not mistaken, the young members of the faculty joined. <clears throat> and they also experimented with translation, which was a surprisingly good thing because their translations were good and uh, it, ju they, it just needed some editing and some more work and all that. And whether they saw themselves as translators or not in future or in the present, they all had the potential for this valuable thing called bilingualism. They were naturals. They could easily translate from Tamil into English for the workshop. And when I said, can you do it vice versa? They said, madam, we can try, maybe some of it. Now, Karunia University exclusively wrote in English, but they, they were avid readers in Tamil. IIS University Jaipur had to submit uh, their works about favorite authors and uh, why are they their favorites and all that. We did it as an exercise to find out how much they read because I cannot overestimate the importance of reading. You have to be a reader, preferably a voracious reader in order to improve your writing and improve your horizons generally. So this exercise gave us, an, uh, gave us a clue to how many of them beyond, went beyond the syllabus to read books and all that. But most of them wrote in English and they were also good in, uh, good in speaking Hindi and they were reading a little bit of Hindi. CU Raj, the Central University of Rajasthan, was the most agreeable surprise we got. Because right at the onset, we were asked if the students can submit certain writings in Hindi and Rajasthani, although it was hosted by the English department. Excuse me. We said yes, because I read Hindi. And I inducted some experts in Rajasthani in my team. What turned out then was they wrote far better in Hindi and in English, sorry, in Hindi and in Rajasthani than in English. It had the, the, the fabric of their writing had the natural speech rhythms of the language that they spoke at home. They spoke with their peers, they spoke at elevator, they spoke at a cafe, in all these environments. And it is it was something that had to be developed. Of course, they were learning English because they had been, they were all UG and PG students of English. So this is where we come to language skills. Whether or not you choose to be a writer, honing your skills for writing. It gives an outlet to express yourself, just as I said. And it gives you clarity. And when you write that important mail for an interview, a clearly enunciated thought is always impressive and gives a glimpse of yourself to the reader. This is where we, I've come to know, you see, like my second son is a doctor. And he says, how, how much a disadvantage the medical students are 
because there is no English department, unlike for many engineering students. So unless you've gone to a very good public school, you're comfortable. But otherwise, there are doctors who are comfortable only within their vernacular, their region. And when they try to uh, you know, spread their wings and go to other parts of India and all that, they are at a disadvantage. So, but with the engineering students, such as, uh, you know, I had a very, very good experience uh, as a teacher in the IIT Delhi because they were so proactive. They would done, uh, do a lot of thorough homework and uh, they were far better than these former English honor students of Delhi University, believe me. So they were very, very good and it made them very uh, confident that they had this grip before they set off for the world. Next is the importance of English. Whether it is verbal or written, it cannot be overlooked. It gives you a global edge and it is best to recognize each language for its importance without a bias, without privileging one over the other, without any political agenda we have to recognize it. So here you see, like when I've taught uh, students in Hindi, in the Hindi belt, Delhi and all that, there are some who do very well. There are some who fumble, but they learn their ropes and then they come out. But there are these typical mistakes that I want to share with you while learning in English, which can be uh, taken care of with uh, regular classes and writing uh, exercises. I had a married student, let me share a funny experience. A married student who would always be in a hurry to go. She'll say, my uh, son is very small. I have to watch him. One day I asked her, how old is your son? She said, 4.30. What she meant, of course, was four and a half. Sade char in Hindi. Or it can be taken in Tamil as nalare. For nalare, it was 4.30. This linguists call it as a L1 interference. It is the language one interference. So slowly and steadily, as we put students through their bases in English, they overcome this, and then they learn to write idiomatic English. If you have to write English, it, it better be that idiomatic English. One author I could recommend to all of you uh, to uh, for communication skills in English is Catherine Lim. She's been doing a lot of research in Southeast Asian dilemma. Why does she call it a dilemma? She still finds in her uh, research field research that people carry this obsolete baggage that it's a colonial language. It's a foreign language. Why should we learn it? So you get narrower and narrower and narrower. And here, Catherine Lim shows why it's so very important to strengthen up your English because it is already in a self-strengthening environment. Knowledge feeds English, English feeds knowledge, it's like that. So I'm quoting her, new language education with the goal of staking a claim in the present world economic order invariably means the use of English, the understanding. Sorry? Is there something you would like me to do? Can I continue? Please. Okay. Catherine Lim highlights the importance of English in the present world economic order because of trade and commerce multinational corporations, travel, entertainment, communication industries, medicine, science, information technology, and it is all operating as a powerful self-reinforcing cycle. That is the way that uh, the perspective that she got in the South Asian larger picture. But when it comes to India, we need to teach English right now in such a way that it has a comprehensive effect on the learner. Like 
I could find out bilingualism, the potential for bilingualism in Madurai, in Karunia uh, uh, University, Coimbatore, and in Rajasthan and all that. This is a potential that has to be nurtured from the colleges and the universities. There should be an institutional promotion of this bilingualism because they will be invaluable. They can promote regional languages by translating them. They can just be better adjusted human beings in the process of, uh, you know, being this thing. Let me tell you, the spirit of the times is not even bilingualism, it is multilingualism because we all move out. I am called an expatriate Tamil writer because I'm based in Delhi. I write in Tamil sometimes. And uh, Indians writing in Indian languages and even in English are called diaspora writers. Those who are in the US and the UK, Europe, parts of Europe, Sri Lanka, wherever, Canada. So these are the definitions that are coming in. And what is it true? There is a kind of a spirit of the times, which is the zeitgeist of a time, which is multilingualism. And there was a very, very um, profound uh, editorial in April in the Times of India, which said, let us teach English or any language for that matter to students to remove the bias and the polarization in their minds. Because while I was talking about Catherine Lim and English and all that, I was not crusading for English. I was just defining the importance of English. And similarly, if I were to say something for teaching of Tamil and all that, I was not going to be uh, narrow in, the, in my you know, parameters for this. So this editorial said, most of these uh, students, the new crop of students have been taught to see a false binary. There is no binary. There is no polarization, except for political vested interests. So it is a certain way of, you know, overcoming the hurdle of a language and to think creatively in both the languages. So, so much I wanted to share uh, about creativity, inspiration and all that. It doesn't matter if I don't have to, but <clears throat> because I'm going to give this paper to Dr. Meghla Rajan, it will be the property of the English department of uh, MCC College. So you can, anybody who wants to write can write. But all that I will say is like these two mutually exclusive camps of taking up a contra position is very artificial. And I should plead guilty to, uh, you know, being an audience in, uh, especially because uh, I'm from the English, uh, I, I have taught in English department. English seminars will see people taking a curious, you know, assuming a very curious persona. For that period, they will position one language over the other, other language over the other. And, uh, you know, that it, it is, it just rings very, very false. There is no such thing. So I was very pleased and I will just uh, uh, address the other language groups in your college. Dr. Mekala Rajan told me, I was so happy to know that you have students from Kerala, Andhra, and the Northeast, which includes so many other languages from Meghalaya, Nagaland, Mizoram, Manipur, Sikkim, and all that, the diversity at all, all that. And I got to meet some of them at Nehu, Northeastern Hill University at Shillong, where I just saw the rich diversity of this. So I will wish to conclude so that we have more time for an interchange, the paper you can always have. And I conclude by saying there is, there is a life outside the walls of the auditorium in a conference or a seminar. And it pulsates with a range of voices and languages that carry a wealth of wealth, lived experience complete with the ethos and mores of people who bring with them their indigenous values and their collective memory. It is a life in which people function on multiple levels. To tune in to the richness of this diversity is the privilege of every Indian. I have every hope 
that you, the generation, will be the game changer for future. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for that enlightening lecture. Uh, you spoke very well on the importance of uh, reading particularly and on multilingualism and how creativity gives you a space for sharing your innermost feelings. Uh, I'm sure uh, our students will have benefited a lot from listening to this. Thank you very much, ma'am. So now we will, we will be announcing the winners of the Teaching RNN essay competition in a short while. This will be followed by a question and answer session with the chief guest. The students are requested to post their questions in the chat box. I request Professor Christina Dhanashekran, Assistant Professor of English Madras Christian College, to announce the winners. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Deepa. Um, so I would like to read out the topic for the essay competition. And here's the topic. The role of literature in fostering medical humanities and emotional well-being during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I think we've been grappling with tough times for these two years, but our students have gotten so creative even in exploring this and the kind of connect that they could do with uh, humanities and especially with literature. So very, very happy to announce the results. So the first place goes to our dearest Kadravin from second MA. And he's always been uh, such a wonder to have in class fusing uh, all the traditional allusions with uh, his unique individual talent, I must say. The second place, uh, I request uh, the students to kindly switch on their videos. If they could just say a hi, it'll be great. Kadravin, if you could pop up and say a hi, quick hi. All right, um, yeah, uh, so the second place goes to Asha Mary. And um, again, Asha is known for her very quirky perspectives and uh, absolutely uh, refreshing um, thoughts as such. And Asha, if you're here, we would like to see you. You could say a quick hi. The third place goes to Joanne Swarna with her very, very carefully crafted thoughts and beautiful clarity in expressing anything that she has to say. Joanne, we're waiting for our prize winners yes, to... Joanne's here, hi Joanne. Hello ma'am, thank you. For joining us. Uh, we also have a consolation prize to announce. Um, I mean, we were just floored with all the inputs from the, all the lovely entries that we got from all the participants. Uh, but we could choose only these three. And then we also have a special consolation prize that goes to Christy Bobbin. Christy, if you're here, you could say a quick hi. We're still waiting for Kadravin and Asha too, if you are able to join. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much and all the, uh, I mean, great congratulations to all of you, uh, all you winners. And I think with the showers of blessings, uh, maybe we have a cloak of invisibility, but you have made yourselves visible with the lovely words that you've given to us. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Professor Christina. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Q&A session. I welcome my colleague, Dr. Phoebe Angus, to kindly moderate the session. Over to Professor Phoebe. Thank you, Professor Arun. Good morning, everyone. Uh, those of you who have questions, you can post your questions on the chat box. If uh, you have joined us on YouTube, you can uh, post it in the uh, chat box that's available on YouTube as well. So while you do that, a uh, little bit of um, heads up on some of the points that Ma'am was sharing. Ma'am was talking about the learning curve during the process of writing and a lot of examples uh, Ma'am had shared from her own experiences as well as experiences that she had uh, through the various workshops, creative writing workshops that um, Ma'am was a part of, and how uh, uh, the, the learners, the participants of the various workshops, they were very enthusiastic about writing in their own mother tongue. In, For instance, in uh, Rajasthani or in Hindi, they were able to 
uh, write in their own language. There, there was a freshness when it came in writing in their own uh, mother tongue. And uh, then another point that Ma'am shared was how you must be a voracious reader if you want to become a writer. But to begin with, uh, Ma'am gave an example of how writing is uh, something that comes from within. In fact, when she was in school, she used to write only when the editors had asked her or requested her to write. But then she, that is where she discovered her love for writing when they told her that her writing was full of uh, uh, expressions and so on. Yes, if there's any question, anyone would like to ask a question. If you are on uh, the Zoom call, you can raise your hand. I would just stop. I'm just giving a, uh, some of the points that Ma'am had shared so that you can probably take off from there from whatever point I'm sharing. Then uh, the spirit of, this is a time of multilingualism, the spirit of multilingualism. Also ma'am had explained through a lot of uh, examples and the examples of how uh, the, there is an L1 interference when we are learning uh, the language and that has to be identified by us English teachers when we are trying to uh, train our students in speaking this language. And finally about positioning of the language. And uh, ma'am had mentioned how it is artificial to take a con contrary position uh, when it comes to positioning the language. So these are some of the highlights of ma'am's inspiring um, lecture. So would anybody like to ask a few questions on this or any comments that you would like to share? You can post it on the chat box on the YouTube channel as it's live streaming or on the Zoom chat box. Yes, anybody? They could add on points or they could share their observations, if not questions. Yes, there's a question from Angelin Prem Kumar. How difficult was it to caricature such a complex character like Amani in translation? I can't see it on my chat box. So could you repeat that question? Yes, yes, ma'am. That's uh, on the YouTube chat. I'll repeat the question again. How difficult was it to caricature such a complex character like Amani in translation? Uh, each writer uh, poses a kind of a challenge. And it was a challenge to translate an author like uh, T. Janaki Raman. I tell you why, because I don't think I mentioned this. I rather went on to an example about uh, the new gender, use of new gender, other and all that. The difficulty with this particular text is it is steeped in music. And T. Janaki Raman is very, very good in classical music. In Marapashu, he straddles two realms. One is music, which you hear orally. Music is for the ears. One is words which is his medium for the novel. So he overcame this challenge being a very talented writer by uh, his diction, which was bordering on poetry. Very often, it will be something poetic. So that is what, you know, it was challenging and it was also very, uh, it was a challenge that I enjoyed because it took me closer to the realm of poetry. So that is T. Janaki Raman. With certain other writers, I have translated uh, Tanjay Prakash, a short story. And uh, that was a very different kind of a thing. It was uh, more about uh, alienation and the mood of an alienation and how a woman exiles herself out of a city to the boundary and all that. Everything, every word went towards this uh, kind of a feeling of an alienated, uh, alienated individual. So it was another kind of challenge to live within that kind of a mood. It was a mood translation. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, there's a question from Abhita Krishna Kumar. Abhita Krishnam Kumar would like to know your views on the intersections between translation and gender. Can you repeat translation that and gender. 
intersections between translation and gender gender yes gender there is plenty there is plenty i have uh, an example that now makes me laugh but some years ago it was very very uh, frustrating for me i wrote a story about a woman who was brutalized by her husband who is a dacoit she used to be physically abusive uh, to her and uh, orally abusive to his own mother he's a rough person a uh, dacoit so my story 20 years ago when i wrote it in tamil was uh, it showed the same woman champa when he goes to the gallows and he is sentenced to death she is happy and relieved she is happy and relieved that her husband brutal husband will die okay and her mother in law will be saved also along with her. no publisher in tamil published they said how can you show a woman who is relieved or much less happy that her husband has died her husband is a husband now after 20 years it got translated into hindi as champa by rajiv gandhi foundation and it's run into the fifth edition so what does it prove it proves that you have certain messages the time is not right for it but 20 years down the line nobody bats an eyelid they say, they just say oh champa is right if i was in her position i would also be relieved to be rid of this physically abusive person so look at the way translation and gender the translation in hindi has liberated the original text in tamil which could not be published and rajiv gandhi foundation took it this is one example gender always plays a part with publishers and editors who could be very conservative Yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there's another question from Ahmed Harris, and he says, with regard to learning during writing, what, according to you, is a perfect college-level essay that could surpass expectations, and how could we write that? This question. The perfect call for. The perfect college-level essay that could surpass expectations, and how could we write that? is this uh, person juxtaposing essay as against creative writing i think he's focusing only on college level writing no um? of course it is of course it is because uh, it it uh, puts you in a critical mold we have all written essays and uh, we have grown up we have grown up with the strength of the essays that we wrote because the essays tend to be critical so we have written essays like creative writing workshop that we did we also are call for essays along with stories and all that so it was not just even though it was called creative writing we uh, did not dispute the fact that an essay also calls for creativity that is that thank you ma'am there is another question from angelin prem kumar what were the problems in translating a text that was ahead of its time both with regard to its form and content who was ahead of his time uh, what were the problems in translating a text that was ahead of its time both with regard to its form and content i don't know this text can can so general, you i think if a uh, general question about translating a text ma'am so for the text is ahead of its uh, uh, its time so oh. what were the difficulties that were encountered in translating such a text by uh, you mean uh, the example that i said yes ma'am i think that's what she said i did not do the i did, i of course i translated it into english and uh, if you are citing the example that i gave you about gender is that right is that right no any text any text ma'am not with regard to gender but any text like to gender. know from this person what he means by ahead of his time yes sir uh, angelin prem kumar could you uh, probably elaborate a little bit on your uh, question uh, 
uh, there's a comment in the chat box and that says did you try to publish the tamil original recently of champa very uh, the question reads so very heartening that the story champa found acceptance 20 years later 20 years later did you try to publish the tamil original recently Am I getting a amplifying remark about what was ahead of the times? You see, like uh, mm -hmm. if I may, if I may, uh, Doctor Phoebe, if yes, I may yes. refer to my own translations because all those titles, Nandanvan, Genesis, uh, and uh, many others, Going Home, they're all translations of my works from Tamil. So when I was translating what whatever I wrote in Tamil, so. I'm just speculating on this person who's asked the question about ahead of his time. So it's a question, it's a mixture of stories. Many of the stories, the editors are not ready for the stories. They hem and haw, and then they say, oh, I say, okay, okay, we will publish this. And then they publish it and all that. And uh, one such another trajectory I will share with you because as a lady uh, faculty, you would understand uh, you know this writer, Simone de Beauvoir, French? The feminist, the big feminist writer, Simone de Beauvoir. One of my uh, uh, long stories was about Simone de Beauvoir and an Indian, young Indian writer who aspires to be a this thing. She's just uh, beginning as a writer and all that. Nobody published it in India. They felt that it was like this person is saying, it was ahead of the time. We haven't come to a stage where we can understand Simone de Boer. At that time, Dr. Phoebe, my question, private question to me was, is it because I wrote in Tamil and I am in English department and we are exposed to Simone de Boer, Jhopal Satra, who is her companion, the Nobel Prize winner and all that. We know their history and we know that uh, Simone de Beauvoir was very fond of an American author, Nigel Alcrim. We know the history, and I am face to face with this Tamil editor who wonders why I have to write about Simone de Beauvoir and who is going to read and all that. So, you know what happened to the story? It went on a long journey to a uh, uh, Tamil Patrike in Paris, in France. And then it came back to India in an anthology. So it made my friends in the faculty laugh because they said Simone is French. So whether you write about her in, in Tamil or not, she has to travel to France and get an, anointed by <laughs> the French audience, then return with glory to India in an English translation and then there she so you see that the gender plays a part and uh, what is ahead and all that. I don't know if it is this divide between uh, Tamil and English department and our exposure, which is different. Now I'm asking you if I may, it's very wrong for a speaker to ask a question. I'm here to answer questions, but I just uh, would be very interested in your opinion because you're from the faculty page. Dr. Fee, do you think there is a divide? Because we are in the English department, our exposure to writers are different from Tamil department. Maybe it depends on one's perspective or, or interests. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for answering the questions. Uh, participants, we have uh, time for two questions. We'll take two more questions. Uh, one is from Deepa Priyadarshini. And uh, she's asked about uh, translating words loaded with culturally specific meanings. Translating texts or uh, words loaded with culturally specific meanings. And what were the difficulties that you encountered yeah. in translating such yes, words? Yes, yes. It's a, it's a very, very good question. Very pertinent question for any translation because uh, a text is culture specific, some more so. It comes with a uh, big ethnic baggage. 
so you know i mean you don't even if you don't translate like for this novel uh, the glass bead curtain i had to give a long glossary of tamil words and it was steeped in tamil sensibility although i wrote in english i wrote in english and then it turned out to have a very very tamil sensibility because of the glossary and because of the way i wrote sometimes i felt maybe i was translating certain things into english in this english novel so i got a curious comment from uh, this distinguished playwright indira park sarathi epa he's called epa indira park so when he wrote uh, when he read the glass bead curtain he told me you know i felt that i was reading a tamil novel in english he said so the, this is uh, something that we try to preserve in uh, translation glossary helps uh, a little bit of uh, innovativeness helps in culture specific items thank you the last question thank you ma'am the last question is from shannon patricia this is a question on poetry as a personal genre do you agree to frost's idea of poetry as one which begins in delight and ends in wisdom do i agree or oppose do you agree to frost's idea of poetry as one which begins in delight and ends in wisdom what is your opinion on poetry as a personal i genre? lost the second half of the question do i agree uh, with with frost's idea of poetry uh frost frost robert frost's idea of poetry uh, which begins in delight and ends in wisdom so uh, the main question is what's your opinion ma'am on poetry as a personal genre the question is a bit diffuse if i may say so but uh, i just don't know if you can split it up into the second i mean uh, what exactly does it ask me the your opinion on poetry as a personal genre opinion on poetry as a personal uh, genre like uh, something that begins in delight and ends in wisdom so do you agree with that uh, the, the poetry is uh, uh, the purpose of poetry is something that begins in delight and ends in wisdom it could be projected so that i do justice to this question can it come in the chat box yes ma'am i'll type the question in the chat box yeah. Yeah, because the other question came on the chat box, it is so clear. Poetry as a personal genre, Shaw's idea of poetry. How nice to say this, yeah. as one who begins in delight and ends in wisdom. Totally, I totally agree with Frost that it's a very personal genre, and uh, the paradox is you write something personal and then you publish it, publish it for everybody to read. so they have hangs that this thing but it begins on a uh, as a poor personal genre and uh, frost as always is so good he himself is full of wisdom so he says you begin with in delight and end in wisdom i'm so glad for this person who asked this question about my favorite genre and i'm very thankful that you projected it in the chat box otherwise you know the sound is uh, uh, just uh, kind of fading off and coming on it's not consistently clear now we through with questions yes ma'am thank you ma'am thank you so much for, for asking, asking the questions. questions thank thank Thanks. all the participants for uh, the questions and now over to uh, uh, deepa ma'am professor deepa can you take over thank you ma'am i now do up invite professor david abraham from the english department to deliver the vote of thanks uh thank you deepa Uh, first and foremost i would like to thank god almighty lord and savior jesus christ for having enabled us helped us and guided us with his wisdom to successfully conduct this endowment lecture my sincere thanks to mr ranganarayanan for instituting this lecture in memory of his father the late tg narayanan this is the 10th endowment lecture and if my memory serves me right mr ranganarayanan has always made it a point to be a part of the lectures a part of all the lectures right from the first lecture delivered by dr gauri vishwanath up to today's lecture delivered by dr lakshmi kanan with profound gratitude i would like to place on record my thanks 
to Dr. Lakshmi Kannan, eminent poet, novelist, short story writer, and translator, for consenting to deliver this very meaningful lecture titled On a Learning Curve. Thank you, ma'am, for being with us and sharing your rich experience and for your valuable suggestions, which will definitely help our students in becoming creative and innovative. I'm very sure that our students are all inspired after listening to you. I would like to thank our principal, Dr. Paul Wilson, who has been a great pillar of support and encouragement in all our academic endeavors. My thanks are due to our bursa for his financial assistance for all the activities of our department. Words aren't sufficient enough to thank our beloved head of the department, Dr. Meghla Rajan, for her efficient leadership, for her efficient leadership qualities that has witnessed the happening of this endowment lecture. Dr. Meghla Rajan has never delegated things and supervised its execution. Instead, she herself will meticulously get involved in all the tasks and activities in order to witness perfection as it happened in the case of today's lecture. I would like to thank all the former professors and friends who have joined us online. To all my colleagues in the Department of English, thanks a lot for all your contributions which made this endowment happen. Special thanks to Professor Arun Kumar and his entire team for effectively taking care of the technical side. We are very well aware of what happens when, technol when technology miserably fails. Thank you, Arun, for helping us conduct this program without any interruption. Thanks to one and all who were part of this endowment lecture. Thanks for making this endowment lecture a great success. God bless the Department of English. God bless the Madras Christian College. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you everyone for joining with us and making this a memorable day for all of us. Looking forward to meeting you all next year for the 11th edition of the PT Narayanan Endowment Lecture. Until then, be safe, take care, and may God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much. We would request all of you to kindly switch on your videos for a screen capture so that it will be a memorable for the entire department. So requesting all of you to kindly switch on your uh, videos so that we'll do a screen capture, all of you. Smile, please. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, ma'am, for that lovely. Thank you, thank you uh, all. It's been a wonderful morning. Very stimulating. I wish I had spoken less and had more time for questions. Mm -hmm. Good to see you, Premila Pao. Hi, Lakshmi. Hi. 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 <laughs> Lovely to reconnect. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajan, Mekla Rajan, for making this happen. Thanks for accepting and joining, ma'am. Otherwise, we wouldn't have managed. Thanks a lot. Entirely, entirely my pleasure. Entirely. My thank pleasure. you. Thank you. Bye. My prayers. Yeah. Hi, Mekla. Hi, ma'am. <laughs> That's lovely. Oh, wow. Thank you. Hi, Christina. <laughs> so happy.